good evening again. Um, I want to, I would like to propose to start a discussion from this film. Uh, and I'm curious, why is this film so important to you? I mean, it was one of your four picks for this festival. Yeah, I could have picked another four and another four and another four, but um, I was very close to my uncle and I think it already, those who've seen Midnight Cowboy and, and, uh, and Darling and um, Sunday Bloody Sunday and so on will recognize that a lot of his style is already in this film. Yeah. And um, he came up through, uh, he learned his trade as a filmmaker by work making documentaries for the BBC. And it was very much part of the, uh, the scene uh, in the British film industry at the time. Uh, films made before the war tended to be a bit like plays, about usually about upper class people with long cigarette holders and that kind of thing. And British films in the late 50s and 60s tended to be realistic, a bit like the t Italian neo-realism, neo neo and uh, concentrate on sort of the working class of the North Country and so on. And um, the documentary style is very much part of that, mm -hmm. except that there were two schools, really. Um, my uncle went to university at Oxford, and uh, another student at Oxford at the same time was Lindsay Anderson. Mm -hmm. And they never got on very well because Lindsay Anderson was very political and, and part of the sort of left-wing school of filmmakers and thought that films had to be political and so on. Uh, John was much more a humanist. Uh, he was sort of a liberal in politics, but he didn't want his films to have a specifically political message. He, he looked at little details of human behavior and with humor and compassion and, uh, and, 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 and so on. And so, a lot of what he did in, in his later films are already very, very uh, visible in this one. And um, since I followed his career since I was a child, um, uh, and, and it's important to me personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, was this one of the reasons? I know that in the beginning of your... When we were uh, very young, you were very passionate about cinema, no? I mean, you studied cinema, if I'm not uh, wrong, mistaken in Japan, or...? Well, um, I always rather hero-worshipped my uncle, so we, we were... Uh, and, and my mother's family was a rather theatrical family. My aunt was an actress in the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, my grandmother was a violinist. My mother played the cello, so the arts were very important. And... I think the first adult film that I saw um, was 55 Days in Peking, which and in Holland you had uh, categories. Um, you had all ages, over 14, over 18. And I think I was 12. And uh, with a couple of neighborhood kids, uh, we went to see this over 14 film. And we thought we could make ourselves looking very adult by burning a cork and putting, and sort of having black rings under our eyes. And I think we also put scarves in our um, jackets to make our shoulders look broader. And in those days, in cinemas, you still had men in uniforms um, with sort of uniform hats and gold things on their shoulders. And I still remember his face when he looked at me. He looked me up and down, he said. <laughs> but somehow we sneaked in. That's my an early film memory. Um, but I was always fascinated by film. and I. I didn't really know, like most people, when I was 18 or 19, what I wanted to do. And I was studying Chinese at a time that you couldn't really go to China unless you were an official friend of the, of the Chinese people in an organized tour. And uh, I wasn't attracted to Mao's China particularly either. And I saw a lot of Japanese films at the Cinematheque in Paris and in London and in Amsterdam and so on, and some modern theater. And I thought, that's much more interesting to me and so I decided well I wouldn't I'd like to make films or be a photographer and so I went to I got a scholarship to go to a film school in Tokyo which wasn't a very good film school the only real memory I have is with a very old Japanese film director from the silent era who um, spoke slush like that so my Japanese wasn't really good enough to understand everything he said but especially when he spoke like that. But what he did do, he, he was very proud that he'd been, he had assistant, assisted Charlie Chaplin in Hollywood. And he could do great imitations of Charlie Chaplin. And 
uh, explained to us how Charlie Chaplin directed films and, uh, and so on. So that was my start. But I soon realized, I did make some documentaries, but I soon realized <clears throat> I wasn't cut out for filmmaking because I didn't have the patience. You have to be very patient. You have to be able to wait for a year for the finance to come in and then things still, projects still collapse and uh, it would drive me crazy. So um, for a while I was a photographer and then I started um, uh, writing film reviews actually I in Tokyo. In Japanese? No, it was for an English language newspaper called the Japan Times. Oh, okay. That was... Uh, um and you wrote only on Japanese films? Or no, no, I wrote, but no, no, but I, I was their film reviewer. Uh, and then I did that for about a year. And then I got tired of my own voice. Um, the, the, the critics, can, or reviewers in particular, uh, can become very tiresome um, because you adopt a kind of pompous attitude of sort of doing that all the time to work that other people have spent years doing. And um, I didn't want to spend my life doing that. But if I read in one of your books, I think it's one of the most recent ones, that uh, about your um, um, links with the theater, with the underground theater in the 70s in, uh, in Japan, it was in the same period, no? Yes, it was in the same Can period. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Also, you, you were also involved uh, in some theater. Well, the reason the I theater. went to Japan was not just the cinema, it was also because there was a, in Amsterdam then you had a, a theatre called the Mikuri Theatre, which was the, a, a sort of centre of um, experimental and underground theatre from all over the world. All the groups came over from uh, America, from um, Japan, from Eastern Europe and so on, Poland. And I saw a Japanese theatre group and I, I was instantly attracted to it. It was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen. And um, I, so I went to Japan and then I st sort of because young Westerners in Tokyo in 1975 who were interested in modern theater and film and so on were so rare, every door was open. I mean, it was also a period that many Japanese wanted to sort of get out into the outside world. And so it, I was a complete nobody, but I could meet people like Kurosawa and Oshima and Imamura and all these people with no problem at all, because I, not because I was interesting, but because I was exotic to them and rare. And, weird. So I met a lot of people and um, I got involved in a theatre group um, and they performed very wild, zany, absurdist um, uh, pieces written by the theatre director who also uh, acted in his plays. And we, they would perform them in a big red tent which we would, uh, and we'd go on tour uh, through Jap all over Japan with it and put, on the, red, put the red tent up on uh, river beds and in car parks and so on. And what they did is they, they tried to, they rebelled against the sort of um, high Western culture which had been adopted uh, by the Japanese since the 1860s in their zeal to, rep to Westernize. And they also reacted against the rather museum-like classical Japanese theater by trying to, not but trying to imitate kabuki, but by trying to recreate, not even recreate, but to find again the sort of original spirit of kabuki, which was wild and, and uh, I mean, the, the first kabuki actors were prostitutes. And so uh, it was a very exciting time uh, to be involved in the Japanese theater. And this guy was very charismatic. And he wrote a part for me um, in one of his plays. And I was called, uh, because my name in Japan was pronounced Iwam, and so Iwan the Terrible, he played with that. And so he, I was Iwan the Terrible, nicknamed, nicknamed the Midnight Cowboy. And so we went around on this and uh, had a, a very good time. I don't know if I should tell the whole story, but uh, well, and so um, uh, you were so rare as a Westerner in Japan that you became a little bit like a mascot. And so people would come and visit us as we, when we perform our performances and so on, and they'd look at me and say, to Kara, the, man, the name of the guy, and Kara's wife, who was a Korean Japanese, who also acted in the theater, and they had colossal rows often, which the Japanese all put down to her Korean, her, 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 her Korean temperament. And um, visitors would always say, my, my, you've become very international. 
And also, if you were a Westerner, people always assumed you were an American. So people would always ask me questions about America and what was California like, and I said, I don't know. And maybe because I got a little tired of that, and a little frustrated, possibly, you know, th young men are, 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 of course, vain, thinking that people didn't really know me for who I was, whatever it was. But the last night we performed in Kyoto, there was a slight tension in the group, because the young male actor, um, who usually played with Kara's wife, was very handsome. He was known as the James Dean of Tokyo. And he'd just become uh, very successful with Kara's wife in a television soap opera. And Kara was rather jealous of this, especially because young teenage girls turned up and started screaming whenever they saw this guy. And so there we were. Uh, the tent was on the riverbed in Kyoto. It was the last night, and we were going to celebrate the, the last, last performance. And Kara's wife, Li Leisen, the Korean Japanese, went off somewhere else with friends. And we went to a big Japanese restaurant on the second floor on tatami mats. And with us came uh, a slightly second-rate uh, Yakuza film actor, a gangster film actor. The guy who, he was a guy who, who usually died after about 15 minutes into the film uh, and usually died in a very spectacular manner. But he was, and he was there because he was playing that same soap opera with Lee Laysen and this handsome young man. And he was sitting next to Kara. We were sitting around a, a, a long table. And I, could, I noticed that there was something going on. And at one point, Kara smashed this guy in, in the face with his fist. And um, when he did that, Japanese groups tend to be very collective and act a bit like sort of gangs. All the young guys of the group fell upon this man like a wolf pack, and he was carried out on a, on a stretcher with sort of blood all over his face. And I found this rather shocking, but I didn't say anything, but I, I remember feeling shocked and my heart sort of beating. And the reason was apparently that the gangster film actor had been needling Kara by saying, this theater stuff, this is all old fashioned, this is nonsense, you should be on television, and so on. So Kara couldn't take it anymore and went like that. After about half an hour, Kara's wife appeared, furious, with a, a, a absolute, in an absolute rage with her husband, and, and said, how dare you do that to our colleague who's in the same television series? That's an outrage, and so on. And Kara then grabbed a very heavy glass ashtray and threw it at her. It just missed her head and went through a, a, a paper screen. And suddenly, all the frustration of all those of my time in Japan must have boiled up and I did something completely ridiculous and unwise. I stood up and blurted out, that's no way to treat a lady or something <laughs> idiotic like that. Humiliating this man in front of everybody and not realizing that you should never get involved in a marital uh, quarrel anyway. And Kara looked at me, white, he looked a little bit like Ceausescu when he made that last speech and suddenly heard people um, shouting down, his face, he'd never experienced anything like this. He went, he went white, white and looked a little bewildered and then was absolutely furious with me. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, so you're just an ordinary foreigner after all. And then I realized I'd hit a sort of barrier uh, of being a foreigner in a Japanese group. Um, and um, I learned my lesson. Uh, what was the... What was the point when you started to, I don't know, to be interested in history, beside the arts, cinema, theater? Well, I was always interested in history, and I was one of those children who asked my parents all about their lives and how they grew up, and uh, what, what the war had been like, and so on. And I mean, often children, when their parents or grandparents die, they will say, um, oh, I wish I'd asked them more questions, and now it's too late. And that wouldn't, wouldn't happen to me because I always asked them questions. I was always interested in their past. And, uh, and because I was interested in their past, I was also interested in the past uh, in general. And so, uh, uh, and we had a history teacher whom I liked very much. Um, uh, one of the oddities about this history teacher at high school, and he was a lovely man, and he, he certainly encouraged my interest in history. I found out fairly quickly that during the war he had been a terrible Nazi collaborator, which funnily enough in the 60s didn't seem to matter very much. 
Um, only later did it strike me how, how peculiar this was. I mean, I think he even spent some time in prison. And uh, of all things, a history teacher. And I remember him handing out pamphlets in class all about the, how wonderful the apartheid system in South Africa was. So he, he still had peculiar ideas. But he did encourage my interest in history. And so I never became a professional historian. I'm not an academic. But um, uh, I do, do like writing about history. You were talking about patience uh, concerning or regarding making cinema, but uh, I imagine that also being a historian takes a lot of patience to, to study and then to write. Uh, um, and what one, f let's start from something else. So what, why are you so interested in, um, in um, let's say, uh, holo the Holocaust and fascism and? Uh, well, I think because, uh, 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 it's a ha it was haunting to people of my generation because y you realized that your parents had lived through times that were, complete, that, that were very, very extreme. And so you can't help thinking, what would I have done? Can this ever happen again? And so on. And the fact that it happened when I was born, it was only uh, six years after the war. So the fact that it happened in some of the most uh, highly educated and civilized countries in the world um, is a very frightening thought. And there are two ways people react in general to things that, that they are frightened of. A snake, for example, or a rat. Some people look away, don't want to know, don't want to hear about it. So other people, because they're frightened, are mesmerized by it and want to watch that snake or that rat. And, uh, want to know more about the horrors of, of the past and human behavior and so on, and have a morbid fascination for it. Uh, I belong to that school. And uh, uh, the point when, when you started to consider uh, writing uh, books, it was when you were in Japan, or wh when was the turning point, let's say? From well, the turning point was when I was still in Japan, and I was, uh, I was a photographer as well as a, a journalist. And I was asked by the Observer uh, newspaper in London, their magazine, to do a whole issue on Japan. And I, and, and I, was, I did the photographs as well as the texts. And um, uh, a well-known publisher in London uh, saw that and then um, asked me to write a book about Japan. And that was really my breakthrough. And, um, um when you, you work on <coughs> more than one uh, book, one, uh, or you work No, I can only work on one book at a time. Uh -huh. But I learned a lesson from my uncle, which has a good side and a bad side. He, he always, before he'd finished uh, a film, he always made sure he, or, he, he got a contract to do the next one in case it was a terrible failure and it would be harder to get to. <laughs> and he, and he, 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 he had to work, he couldn't stand. Lindsay Anderson could spend years trying to get a project off the ground and wouldn't do anything until he got the project he wanted. My uncle had to work. Um, the, the, the downside of that is that he didn't always choose wisely. I mean, sometimes he chose scripts that he probably shouldn't have done and made films that were not as good as he, 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 he was capable of. But I learned that lesson. and. I always try and make sure that before I finish a book, I'm already on the next one. And um, uh, the process of when you start, uh, I don't know, thinking about a particular book, what is the, what is the do you have a certain kind of uh, specific process? I don't know, you go to that countries and search in the archives from that countries, or I don't know. Well, that depends on the book. Um, I, I don't spend much time in archives because I, I'm really not a professional researcher or, histor or a historian in that sense. Um, with me, it's more part of the, the writing and, and the thinking and finding interesting angles and so on. I, I, I'm not one to spend years in archives trying to find undiscovered details and that kind of thing. That's for other people. I, that's not for me. Um, but what I do is... Um, uh, I read a lot, and um, I think a lot, and before I start writing, and again, this is very personal, not everybody does, does it that way, I tend to lay out more or less 
the chapters that I want to write and how I'm going to make the argument. Um, and then, of course, that changes as you write. But I have to have it more or less in my head before I start to write. There are filmmakers who do that too. Hitchcock had it all in his head, apparently. I mean, he didn't, he wrote, when he wrote the script, he didn't um, uh, change anything. And uh, he knew how he was going to edit everything, even. Um, Antonioni was the opposite. Apparently, he just shot enormous amounts of material. And it, it was only in the editing room that it sort of would come together. Um, uh, I'm a little bit m more like Hitchcock, though, although not entirely, because things do change. But, um, so once I've got it in my head, and, and more, that I know more or less where I'm going to go, and once I've done the reading, the writing goes fairly quickly. Okay. Um, because one of the reasons why we invited you in the festival, it has to do with, of course, first of all, has to do with the respect we have for your work, but also with um, um, the fact that as a festival we, we try very much to present films that deal with, with the past or with, I don't know, with the importance of past events to, to the way the present uh, looks like or I don't know, uh, is like. And uh, we wanted to have a statement uh, in inviting a historian. Of, of course, you are not only a historian, you also write essays on different uh, literature, or paintings, or music, etc. But mainly because of this, uh, because we wanted to, to emphasize the importance that we think a historian has in, uh, I don't know, for societies. But I want to also ask you, what do you think, if you think that, uh, uh, I don't know, the place of historians has changed, I don't know, uh, since you be began to write uh, until now, and what do you consider that place to be nowadays when, I don't know, uh, uh, yeah. uh, well, I think you have to go down to, uh, and I think maybe in, in different countries the, the, the situation is a little bit different. The, uh, it goes back to the way history is taught at schools. And uh, it used to be that history was taught in order to make you feel proud of your country. It was mostly national history. It was to create young patriots. That's, that's what 19th century school history education was for. And I think that has changed, really, in, in, at least in Western Europe, uh, and, and uh, I think the United States as well, uh, started to change in the 70s when national history education of that type was considered to be old-fashioned. And it changed uh, to be more uh, about civic lessons, about anti-racism and so on. And that's also, of course, when the Holocaust and Anne Frank's diary and all that uh, became the, the main focus of uh, education of World War II, but perhaps of education in general. That people had to, to be taught how to be good citizens and, and not discriminate and all that, which is very different from educating young patriots. And so general history really began to disappear a little bit from the curriculum. And instead of that, I think there, there has been a boom of history writing in books. And that um, right now there's, there's a huge fashion for books about national history, books about the war, books about this, books about that, by historians who write for a popular audience. As though it's to make up for the fact that we don't get so much history anymore in our school education. So I think that has, uh, has changed. And that's why some books about history, not mine, alas, but have become uh, huge bestsellers. And when you started? Sorry? When you started, it was uh, more... Uh, well, I think when I started, it was more that uh, people got a more solid uh, education in history, certainly national history at school, and um, history writing was more academic. And uh, the, the fashion for writing history for a, a, a popular audience has um, boomed uh, later. So I have many more questions, but maybe some of you also have some things to ask or, I don't know, to say to Mr. Buruma. Maybe you saw some of the other films from the selection and or read some of his books. So if you have questions, I can uh, give you the microphone. It always takes a brave first person. <laughs> yes. yes. 
I can't say I'm brave, but uh, I have actually two questions for you. The first one is if you remember the first time you saw the Terminus and what were your feelings. And the second one is what's your favorite 35 millimeter Japanese camera? Oh, it's a long time since I've used one, but um, uh, the first time I saw Termus was, I think, roughly when it, uh, probably when it came out. And we used to follow everything my uncle did, and, and uh, st not only the films he made for television, in the, but he, he was also an actor, a rather bad actor. And I remember he played in Ivanhoe, the series, with Roger Moore as Ivanhoe, and he played the bad horseman, I think. And... Um, he, he also plays a, 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 a sailor in the, the, the battle for the Graf Spee, um, with, um, made by Michael Powell, I think. Um, in any case, uh, we followed his career very closely, so I saw almost everything when it first came out. Uh, the second question, I used uh, Nikons when I was in Japan. Um, but I remember... Um, uh, Wim Wenders, who was then not as famous as he is now, coming to Japan in 1976 or 7, 7 I think, thinking he was going to translate a book by Donald Ritchie about Ozu. And I remember going to a camera store with him, and um, you had this camera called a Conta, Con Contax. And uh, I remember him stroking it and, and then looking at me and said, very sexy. But I never got a Contax. Maybe. Um, hi, my question is actually what the lesson was, because you said you learned a, a lesson from that uh, interaction with uh, Kara, that you, you got him angry and you learned a lesson, but I didn't exactly... Oh, I learned the lesson that it's an illusion to think that as a foreigner you could ever um, be in a Japanese group and, and, and be treated and behave and be treated completely like a Japanese. And uh, you can make friends and, and uh, live there perfectly happily. But foreigners who have the illusion that they can actually, that they will ever be treated as though they are no different from any Japanese, uh, are bound to be disappointed. And th which is why you get a lot of Japanophiles who, when they go and live there, um, end up being rather disillusioned. And then they get angry at Japan for not coming up to their expectations, which is, of course, very unfair. Can um, I follow up here? Yeah. Isn't it true about most cultures, though? I mean. Yes, but some cultures are more insular than others. And um, in Japan, uh, nationality and ethnicity are seen as more or less the same thing. And so, uh, if you're not ethnically Japanese, people can treat you very well or very warmly, but, very, but you'll never be accepted as one of them, even if you. Let's say your um, uh, origins are Korean and you've, lived, you've been there for three generations and you speak nothing but Japanese. <coughs> they'll still sort of think you're a bit different. You're about to ask something else. Do you want to say something else? Um, yeah, I don't know how appropriate it is, though, because I was actually... No, it's appropriate. <laughs> no, I was reading, reading an article um, about... Uh, well, cancel culture, because I, I, I was on Instagram the other day and I saw this post about, about cancel culture. What is cancel culture? Yeah, that's the other thing. that I was like, what is cancel culture? So I Googled it, and then uh, your name was actually in one of, the, one, uh, one of the articles you were given there as an example, um, because apparently cancel culture is something we're, is something we're living nowadays where um, because of the backlash associated with social justice sort of being exerted in every medium, uh, you then cannot really express yourself fully because you're going to be forced to, um, I don't know, make public apologies, withdraw from certain, I don't know, platforms. Sort of, you're being canceled as a person um, oh, on the, ba on the okay. altar of uh, social justice and I higher see, see. ideas. So I was going to ask you if you feel like you're a, if you, if you think this is a real thing, number one, and number two, if you feel like a victim of it. Yeah, I think for those who haven't followed the story, I, what she's referring to is that if, that's uh, certainly in America, um, if you fall foul of, say, the Me Too movement, um, even if you may be innocent or if you've um, uh, done something very minor, 
um, you can become a non-person and become a sort of villain in the social media and you can't, you're not supposed to be seen anymore, a bit like in photographs in the Stalinist period of the Soviet Union when people suddenly disappeared from official photographs. And uh, that has happened to me in a very mild form. I published, I was an editor of a magazine called the New York Review of Books, and I published an article um, by uh, a well-known Canadian uh, radio show host who was accused of uh, sexual abuse by uh, a number of women. And um, he, it, they, four of them took him to court and uh, he, uh, they lost their case, it wasn't proven. Um, but, which doesn't mean he was necessarily innocent because sexual abuse is very difficult often to, to, to uh, prove in court and so on. But he then became a non-person and a villain in the social media, a non-person, he can't get work and so on and so forth. So I thought in the whole discussion about Me Too, um, which has aims with which I entirely agree with, uh, I thought it would be interesting to have the voice of somebody to whom something like that had happened because it raised the issue of what we should do if people are not punished by the law for which there are clear guidelines. I mean, you get a punishment, you have to go to prison, and it had three years, four years, ten years, and so it's, it, it, it's clear. Punishment by social media is very fuzzy. You don't know how long it's supposed to last, you don't know how, how, how far it's supposed to go and so on. So I thought it would, would be interesting to have his personal account uh, of what, what had happened to open that discussion. Now that caused a tremendous uh, Twitter storm and um, people started going through everything I'd ever written to prove I was a woman hater and so on and so forth. I lost my job as an editor and was given to uh, understand that um, I, my, uh, after having written for more than 30 years for various magazines, liberal magazines, um, uh, for the time being, um, my writing was no longer wanted. So in that sense, there is a cancel element going on, but it's very political. So the uh, very conservative uh, journals immediately wanted me to write because they wanted to use me as a stick to beat the politically correct with which I didn't want to do either. And the, the, the moral of the story is that in a time of great polarization, when the right is becoming more and more frighteningly bigoted and the left in some ways is becoming rather intolerant, it's the sort of liberals in the center who get squeezed. And I think I would, that's the way I would describe it perhaps more than that I've been completely canceled out because if that were the case, I wouldn't be sitting here. Hello. Uh, when you were in Japan, did you get to personally meet Kurosawa and speak to him? Yes, I did meet Kurosawa, and um, um, Kurosawa was not a man of great small talk. Uh, he really only wanted to talk about his work and his films. Um, but he'd heard all the questions, the usual questions about his films so many times that that sort of bored him too. But what he, he did like to do is to talk about the technical aspects of his films. I mean, if you asked him about camera movements and uh, that sort of thing. He, he, he could be quite talkative, but <coughs> he was not an easy man. And um, I was asked by uh, his producer, who also produced commercials for, uh, for uh, Santori Whiskey, to uh, be in a commercial with him. And um, the, co the, the, the commercial was uh, to be shot in his country house, which is near the Fuji. And we were supposed to drink whiskey and talk to Kurosawa, me and two other foreigners. And uh, um, so we were there drinking whiskey and trying to talk to Kurosawa, and it was impossible to get anything out of him. And so the commercial was not going well. Also, because Kurosawa was making the director of the commercial very nervous by constantly giving directions and saying, no, no, that camera is in the wrong place, it should be there. So this poor director was sweating and didn't and, and constantly looking at Kurosawa to see whether he was doing the right thing and so on. So, but after a while I asked him something about, there was a, there's a famous film that he made called Throne of Blood, which was shot very near there. And I asked him something about how many cameras he'd used when Mifune gets all the arrows um, shot at him at the end. And that got him going. And, and, and so the commercial was saved. I'm not sure it was ever shown. And uh, what do you think about the films of Yasujiro Ozu? Uh, 
No, I, I, I mean, there are many people who say that the three great classic directors in Japan are Kurosawa and Ozu and Mizuguchi, and of course they're all very different. Um, uh, and some people say you either like one or the other, but you can't like... I like all three. Um, uh, I like Mizuguchi particularly, um, but I, I love Ozu and, and I, I love Kurosawa's best movies too. <coughs> I think Kurosawa perhaps um, went on too long. And uh, Well, what happened in, with Kurosawa is that the earlier films, he, he worked together with script writers who were the same age. And so they could, they had a big influence on him and, uh, and so on. When they started to die and he got older and he started working with much younger people whom he can completely control and would, who would never contradict him, the films didn't get any better. For the, uh, so I think um, he suffered from that a little bit. But uh, no, I, I love Ozu's films uh, the, the, uh, unconditionally. And uh, unlike Mizuguchi and Kurosawa, I don't think Ozu ever made a bad film. And I can't think of many directors uh, who never made a bad film. And I could think of two. Ozu and I don't think Bunuel ever made a bad film. Can you think of one? Uh, uh, beside those two. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe René. I don't know. But there are not many. <clears throat> Stanley Kubrick as well. He's no, well, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> yeah, he made Fear and Desire. But because you asked about Japanese cinema, um, <laughs> you didn't select in this um, uh, section, in this program, in our festival, any uh, Asian film from Japan or from China. Um, and I would like to ask you if, if you would rec if you would recommend us some doc filmmakers who are specialized in documentaries or. I don't know, documentary, specific documentaries right. from Japan. Yeah, I rather you, regret now that I didn't pick one, but, um, well, you've already had Hara here last year, right? Yes, Kazuo well, Hara. Um, yes. I think the films, but the, the documentaries made by Imamura are really interesting. And uh, he made documentaries in the 70s, I think. He made about th four, and they're all really interesting. The, 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 well worth seeing. Um, I would recommend those more than any, than any I think. Other questions? There must be more. I feel very hurt if you don't ask me anything more. Coming back to the movie we have uh, watched um, now, uh, I was wondering what would you point out as a reviewer, um, the things that you appreciate uh, most? Well, I appreciate most his eye for detail. And I think that's also because he started as a photographer. And so he, and you see it in his feature films. He uses documentary details in the in the feature films too. If you if you remember Midnight Cowboy, there are all kinds of little observations of, about the streets in New York and so on. Um, and so I, I think it's that the humor. And uh, there's another interesting aspect of the film, which um, is the eternal question. To what extent in non-fiction or, or a documentary film you should be able to stage things? Some things I know were staged, uh, like the little boy, because I know who he was and or is. Um, and uh, many documentary filmmakers do stage things. Uh, Flaherty um, with Nanook of the North certainly did. It, it's possibly, possibly inevitable. Ver, um, uh, Werner Herzog completely stays. He makes things up. Staging something like a scene on a, a station, which could be a real scene um, uh, uh, anyway, <coughs> does not really distort reality. Werner Herzog actually does make things up. I mean, the, the, the one of, uh, and he doesn't deny it. Uh, he thinks that cinema. He said he often says he hates cinema verite. He thinks that's a complete sort of bullshit illusion. Um, it's the poetic reality, that's the word he uses, that's important. And trying to 
think that you can actually show reality is, is, is nonsense. And, and the famous example is, I can't remember the title of the film, you might know, is he did a film about a famous lake in Russia, and there's a legend about a, a kind of Atlantis-like submerged city, a sacred city under the lake, and that you pray on the lake and you look and you, uh, to the, the, the sort of sacred spirits of the city. And he, he comes up with this amazing image of all these Russians on this frozen lake with their heads often uh, um, on the ice. And, and Herzog said, you know, sometimes they were so pious that their heads would stick to the ice and so on. And um, uh, it's an extraordinary image. But later he admitted that he just rounded up a couple of local drunks and paid them a, f a few rubles to make them do this. Now, is that okay or is it not okay? It's, it's a very difficult issue because if you know that something is staged like that, it does change your perception of the film. I mean, because partly the part of the strength of a documentary film is, that what you're, that is the understanding that what you're seeing is real. On the other hand, Herzog would make a very good argument why that's not true and why you have to make poetic reality, that that's a higher reality. I think my, myself, um, certainly in writing, I think a writer who presents something as fact and something that has been experienced, a real experience, historical, personal, and so on, should not make things up because I think that's breaking the trust with the reader. Um, and uh, some very, very famous um, writers supposedly of nonfiction have completely broken those rules. I mean, most famously, uh, Richard Kapuscinski. Um, and uh, um, um, I don't know if people here have read um, Curzio Malaparte, uh, who wrote Caput, which is partly, I think part of it is uh, uh, Romanians come into it. Um, but he uh, reworked articles he'd written for the Corriere della Sera during the war when he was traveling on the Eastern Front and uh, totally fantasized stories, the poetic reality. But I don't think he denied it, whereas Kapuscinski did sort of deny it. And I, th I think there's something slightly wrong with that. But the way in this film it was done, I think is just about okay, because they're not scenes that are fantasies. I mean, they're things that happen all the time, and you just help it along a bit by, by, by staging. The same with the woman with the flowers. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Right. Uh, which are the bad movies of Milos Forman, in your opinion? Ah. Yeah, I can't think of many, actually, or any. No, I think he's... Uh, but I admire him very much. Uh, Louis Mal, same. I can't think of a bad Louis Mal film, um, including his documentaries. Uh, still, I think they're Let rare. Let They're rare. Jean Renoir maybe didn't make many bad films either. Maybe. maybe. Any other questions? <coughs> yes. If you can tell us more about the New York um, review of books, because I think it's a wonderful, great literary magazine in the U.S., probably the best Yes, well, whether it still will be now, that's a big question, of course. It's but not anymore? Well, after me, no. <laughs> um, it was a very good magazine because it was uh, founded by two extremely imaginative and, and uh, wonderful people um, called Robert Silvers and Barbara Epstein. And um, for Robert Silvers, Barbara Epstein died earlier. Robert Silvers ed edited it until he was in his 80s and completely lived for the magazine. Um, and it was very, very good. Um, uh, partly, I mean, it's, this again is a, is a big question uh, which you could um, ask about movies as well as about magazines. Uh, some of the great film directors were monstrous tyrants and um, um, behaved 
very brutally towards their staff and their actors and so on because they were such perfectionists that um, they needed to sort of um, force people to come up to their vision. Um, the same thing, uh, Robert Silvers was very harsh in the office and threw things at people, <coughs> shouted at them. In our present era, of course, that is now completely unacceptable behavior. And indeed, I democratized it and sort of in, even the interns were uh, encouraged to come up with ideas and we had editorial meetings and so on, but then as de Tocqueville already explained about the French Revolution, with rising expectations, um, uh, people become revolutionary. But the, the interesting question is whether it is indeed often necessary for a great work of art or a great magazine or a great, a great building, if it's architecture, that it's sometimes not every architect or filmmaker or magazine editor is a tyrant, but whether tyranny of a kind, it can be polite tyranny, it can be brutal tyranny, but that tyranny of a kind is an essential quality. Um, uh, my inclination is to think it probably is. I think you have to be a polite tyrant. You don't, you don't necessarily have to scream at people. But I think for, for a project like that, you do have to have somebody who's very, very firmly in control um, in a way that now has become more difficult than I think it, it used to be. But you're looking skeptical. They have found tyrants and intellectuals once. I'm sorry? Oh, an, an article. Yeah, I'm sorry? Was an article in the New York video. Tyrants and intellectuals. Uh, was there? Yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> Maybe some... Uh, uh, in 2001, they had published a few pages about uh, Mihail Sebastian's diary. Yes. A very nice. Yes. Uh, big pages. Very nice article yes. about Yes, well, you may see less of that now because I think it's, it's now very much edited by people who are less interested in things like Mihal Sebastian and more interested in, say, gender relations at American universities and that kind of thing. But is that a bad thing? I'm sorry? Is that a bad thing? No, that's a question of taste. And, and Robert Silvers, yeah. I, I don't know much about the other person, but I know that like, Barbara Epstein uh, had quite uh, like a, took political stances on, on, on issues that mattered. Mm -hmm. And so it would make sense for um, a person that takes on the job that was done previously by Barbara Epstein to carry on in that same fashion. Yeah, yeah except I'm not sure it's the same fashion. She was certainly politically she was more left-wing than, than Bob Silvers was. She was certainly interested in politics, as, as Bob Silvers was. Whether, if you put to her, whether she would have been entirely happy with the way, the way um, things are being debated or not debated uh, in America today, I'm not so sure. I think she'd be rather unhappy with it. Um, let me think of an example. Well, uh, I, can, I can think of an example as far as content is concerned. I can also think of, it, of an example as far as a sort of more general principle is concerned. There is great concern at the moment, again, which is not wrong, to have more women write for the magazine. And that's not just the New York Review, that's everywhere. That's a, the principle is, is correct. Um, the question is, how do you go about it? My attitude was, you try and find the best articles you can find, and whether they're written by a man or a woman shouldn't matter, but if, you, if they're written by a woman, all the better. Some people take that a step further and say, uh, it doesn't really matter so much how good it is, but it matters more that we have six women in the magazine this week than, rather than four. There I would start having my doubts, and I, I, I'm pretty sure Barbara Epstein would have. Um, I can give you one example of a disagreement we had in, in the office, uh, which is, perhaps illustrates it a little bit. Um, 
there was a biography um, of a famous American football player who was black called Jim Brown, who was a huge star in the 1960s and 70s. And he was also a bit like Muhammad Ali in that he was very political. He was an activist for black uh, civil rights and all the rest of it. So a big political and sporting star. Then in the 70s, when he retired from football, he became a kind of B star in Hollywood in the 70s. And he led the life that many people in Hollywood in the 70s led, especially when they were kind of sex symbols, like he was. And so there were wild parties and lots of women and girls and so on. And, um, and then later, he, he did get into trouble because he, it turned out he beat women, some, some women and so on. And now he's a Trump supporter, so it's a rather sad story. In any case, I got a, a well-known American journalist called uh, Jim Walcott, who's very funny and witty and, 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 lacon and, and ironic, to, do, to uh, review this. I think he actually um, offered it, and he wanted to review it. He was interested in this guy. So he reviewed it, and he described the life in Hollywood with a sort of ironic, detached way, which was funny... Uh, and, and, and well done, I thought. And um, some of the younger editors, because it's very generational, these, these splits, immediately objected and saying, he's celebrating the victimization of women. And I said, well, he's not. He's describing a culture as it was. Uh, we don't know whether all the women at these parties were victims. Uh, he's not celebrating it anyway. No, no, he is. He's celebrating the victimization of women. And anyway, some of our readers might be offended. And I said, but as an editor, it's not our job to, to shield potential readers from being offended. Yes, that's exactly our job. And that's a real generational split. I grew up in the 70s when being a bit provocative being even a bit, little bit shocking, were considered to be good things. Um, the young, now, especially in America, terrified of, of offending anybody, especially minorities. But I think if you're too terrified of offending, you end up with a culture where nobody dares to take a risk, and that, that'll be very boring. And but, dangerous. Probably, but, uh, yeah, probably. But, but you're not 25 either. At the same time, isn't it a risk to publish that, that, that bit and that six articles that's not as good as two other articles written by men? That's a risk. <laughs> that's, yeah, but a much less of a risk because nobody's going to criticize you for that. Um, no, there's not going to be a Twitter storm uh, accusing you of being a, a criminal and so on for doing that. But, I mean, you don't have to necessarily create a Twitter scandal for your work. No, no, you don't. Uh, of course not. No, I, uh, uh, but, but it's, it's now an inevitable consequence if you break certain or you, if you push certain uh, social taboos. And I think it's worse in the United States than it is in Europe, but it's, uh, it, it's not unique to the United States. But, uh, you know, as I said, I think attitudes about this... Re uh, it's also at the New York Review. It was not men against women. It was very much people under 30 versus people uh, over 40. And, um, well, these things happen. And what about Donald Ritchie? Did you ever get the chance to meet Donald Ritchie in Japan or afterwards? Yes, Donald Ritchie was, was a very close friend and, and, and a mentor uh, for me. So I knew him very well. Donald Ritchie was uh, an American who um, uh, went to Japan in, in 1946 uh, when Japan was still under the American occupation. And at the time, the American uh, administration, the military administration, had very strict rules against, and, and officially it was called non fraternization with indigenous personnel, meaning Americans were not allowed to um, uh, fraternize with the Japanese. And that meant that coffee sh Japanese coffee shops and restaurants and cinemas and so on, they were not supposed to go there. And Donald Ritchie broke all those rules because he, he was interested in Japan. and he, So he went to cinemas and he learned 
about Japanese film before he could actually speak Japanese um, by just simply watching films. And he said it was a help that he couldn't really understand what was being said because it allowed him to concentrate on uh, how they were edited, uh, how they were visualized, uh, and, and so on, and really learned a lot about the, uh, what made Japanese cinema special um, by sneaking into these cinemas um, when it wasn't allowed. And then he, he stayed in Japan um, most of his life. He went to New York... Uh, in the early 70s where he was film curator at the Museum of Modern Art, for, but he, he couldn't stand it and went back to Japan and lived there until he died. And he wrote some of the, <coughs> of the first very important books on uh, Japanese yes. cinema. And he was a pioneer. And, uh, yeah. and I think in Romania, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, an edition, not on one of his books on cinema, of course, because nobody publishes but uh, it was, there is a collection with very interesting short essays on different topics, and which includes also some articles on uh, uh, some filmmakers like Ozu, uh, Tetsuko Hara, and Zobuchi, etc. So I don't remember the name of the book. But I think it was called one. Some Japanese <coughs> or something like that, or Japanese Faces or something yeah, like that. Something like that, but yeah. I don't remember the Romanian translation, but it's, right. on, it's a polyrom. It's an introduction to his work, I guess. <coughs> Other questions? Did yeah. you have the concept of choosing all this for recommendation? Yeah. I mean, no, I didn't have a concept. I, it, I, it was four films that have meant a lot to me and just came to mind. But as I said, uh, I could choose four different films, and I'm slightly now regretting I didn't choose at least one Japanese one. But Maybe there will be another opportunity. There were actually five choices, but one we couldn't uh, get. It was also The Fog of War by Harold Morris. Oh, you couldn't get that? How, how, how surprising. We didn't remember we tried huh. for a long time, so we had to pick. But also, it was already screened in a oh, I year see. before, so. Uh, but anyway, maybe next time, together with other Japanese films. Yes. About Bard College, uh, can you tell us, uh, do you know Norman Mann? I do know Norman Mann, ah. yeah. But he's no longer there, he, he's retired. Ah, oh. oh, he's retired. Okay. Um, so uh, I do see him from time to time, but he, he's, uh, um, yes, he's a disillusioned American now. He became an American citizen, but um, was never a very convincing American citizen. He's Still very, re and when I'm here, I realize how Romanian he and his wife are. But uh, they wouldn't like me to say that. But but I think they, uh, the, the humor, the body language, the, the, the yeah, in many ways. Um, but of course, he's he's very disillusioned with what America has now become, uh, as I am. Are there besides, because you asked this, you want to tell us something else, no? No, if you, uh, did you meet Philip Roth also? Yes, I did. Uh, in fact, with Norman, I mean, at, at Norman's no. house. No. Um, and, uh, and he and Norman are very close. And um, the reason Philip Roth is uh, uh, buried uh, in the cemetery at Bard College is because of Norman Mania. Um, Philip Roth has nothing to do with Bard College. He did teach there for a very short time, uh, which wasn't a success. But um, he, he, when he heard that Norman Manier wants to be buried at the cemetery at Bard College, Philip said, uh, I want to be buried there too, because then at least I've got somebody to talk to. <laughs> I have a personal curiosity, but it will change completely. I thought a lot of to ask it, but I will. Uh, it will change the direction of the discussion, but nobody seems to have other questions. You have? Yeah, okay. Uh, a, question. Sorry, a question related to what you said. You said, uh, what is America today? So what is America today? Well, you can't answer that, uh, that question, because America <laughs> so, is so big and so varied. And, um, 
it's, it, if you say America is this, then you can also say it's the opposite. So, um, but I think the, the most disturbing thing, well, apart from Donald Trump, who of course makes everything much, much worse, um, but the disturbing thing is what I said earlier. I think that the, it's so polarized that, that everything between uh, the far right and the radicalizing left is now in trouble, in, in danger of getting, being marginalized. And that's very bad for a democracy. But, you know, there, there are still plenty of people who think like I do. I mean, it's not... <clears throat> uh, and, and New York and California are very different from the, the states that supported Trump. And so, so it's... It, the, the saving grace of the United States is that there is still a lot of fight. And it, so it's depressing, but also interesting, because we can see the drama of our time being fought out in America in the most dramatic fashion. I mean, there's, uh, the, there are demonstrations in Budapest against Viktor Orban, but there is no really strong opposition. Uh, in America, there still is. And so um, that gives us some hope. You were looking skeptical. You, you were. Yes. No. Oh. I thought you were no. turning to your husband and saying, well, nonsense. <laughs> uh. So I, yeah. I have one more. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, have you ever seen any movies by Ivan Basel, the Czechoslovakian director? Yes. Uh, Fireman's Ball. No, the, that, the Fireman's Ball is, is, uh, is um, Emil Forman. Oh, but Basel has a lot, a lot to do with it, and they were really similar in yes. the way they did. Uh, but Milos Forman is one of them as well. Uh, this was the first time I saw The Terminus, and I had the feeling of those movies, of early uh, Forman's and Basel's movies in them, and I wanted to ask if it's just me or if you think the same. Yes, I think that they have a very similar sensibility. Um, they're, they're, they're Milos Forman and François Truffaut. I mean, my uncle's favorite directors were Satyajit Ray and, and François Truffaut. And you could see why, because they're, they're deeply humanistic. Yeah, and I think that's true of Forman as well. Yeah, some sort of authenticity, because they, uh, Forman and Passer used a lot of non-actors as actors. Yes. So it's probably really well, that and, and that they had a sense of humor which was never sentimental. It's a very sharp sense of humor. And, um, and it, it, what it, a, a really good humanist artist can do is he can make human weaknesses funny without um, ridiculing them. So there's, there's both compassion and, and a sort of sharp eye for uh, human weakness. And I think... Uh, Foreman had that, and Truffaut had it, and, and, and I think John had that too. So I think the comparison is, is very valid. Also because I think he was influenced by the neorealists, and I think that the, the Czechs were as well. So I have a, as I said, I have a, I have a curiosity, it's related to the, to the, 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 the theme of this edition of the festival. So it's about 30 years that uh, went by since the revolution, in Romania at least, but anyway, since the communists fell in many countries in this part of Europe. So how do you see this part of Europe? I'm not, I don't know if you know exactly Romania, but at least this part of Europe now, uh, after, I don't know, compared to other parts of the world, I don't know, USA, to, to, to the Western countries, the development after the fall of the I shouldn't probably comment because I don't travel in Eastern Europe enough to have a really informed opinion. I mean, I read about it. I've been to Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia and, and, and Romania and East Germany and so on. But I don't know <coughs> enough to say anything very interesting that you can't read about it in, in, in magazines and newspapers written by people who know more than I do. Um, so I, I probably 
unless you ask me something very specific, it's probably difficult for me to make a general comment. Also, I think it depends. I don't think all these countries are the same. Um, all I can say is that it's, liberal democracy is in, under greater pressure uh, in countries, even greater pressure in countries that had to make the transition from communism than they are in Western Europe, but they're under enough pressure in Western Europe too. And so I think that a lot of the problems that you see in, in, in Eastern and Central Europe uh, are not unique to these countries. They may be um, slightly more extreme and slightly more dramatic, but not that much more dramatic than what's going on in France and Britain and uh, even Germany. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, in conclusion, we're all fucked. I'm <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might say you want to end in grade. Right, wait. Here. So thank you very much for, uh, for your presence and for uh, choosing those fields. And we're very happy to have you and also to speak. Thank and you I very hope much. You will come again. Thank you very much.